Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so good morning. I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. Um, as Pastor Seth said at the early service, my name is Rebecca Sherman. And I, for the last two and a half years, have served as one of two bishops associates in the Southwestern Washington Synod. Um, and I'll say more about the staff in a few minutes. Um, I have been a pastor mostly in this synod for, this will be 30 years. I was ordained in 1992. And I've served, call, my first call was at Peninsula Lutheran here in Big Harbor. And that's when Gita and I got to know each other. And then I was just for five years, slightly across the boundary in the Northwest Washington Synod at Zion Lutheran in Kent. Um, and I was associate pastor in both of those congregations. And then I came back into the Southwestern Washington Synod in 2001 and um, was a co-pastor at Bethlehem Lutheran on the near east side of Tacoma. Bethlehem is now um, yoked with United Lutheran in Tacoma, which is what we're seeing more and more of congregations yoking like that. And then for the 11 years before I came into the Synod office, I was on the staff at St. Mark's by the Narrows in Tacoma. So, but I've lived in Gig Harbor for the past 21 years and, um, and have been very familiar with I'm Stay and the ministry here and um, all the lovely people who have been here over the years. So, so I was happy when, when Pastor Seth asked me to, to come and talk about the Southwestern Washington Synod, which um, you're very, I, I feel like familiar with because you're part of it and an active member of the Synod, but it's always good to kind of go back and, and uh, say, what is that? And what does all that mean? There are the doubts. Here's some, I'll put these here um, in case anybody comes in. So um, I, I chose to call this, who is the Southwestern Washington Synod? <laughs> because that is actually what the Synod is. The Synod is a who. Um, and so when we talk about the Synod, uh, first of all, that's a funny word. You know, Synod isn't a word that we use. Most of the time, if I say I work for the Synod, somebody thinks I'm saying Senate. You know, that I work for the Senate. So, um, but synod, the word synod means walking together. So the, the synod is an expression of how all of us who are um, ELCA in this part of the state walk together. So it's a, it's a relationship. It's a relational word. Um, and I, I chose this painting by, I don't know if you say his name, Ho Shi or Hei Qi. I've heard it several different ways, but the Chinese artist who now, I, I think lives in Minnesota, um, his painting of the road to Emmaus, you know, that great story from Luke 24 where the disciples are trying to figure out what just went on. Um, it's the day of resurrection. They are hearing all these rumors. And then the stranger walks with them along the road and in the breaking of the bread, they recognize him as Christ. I love that story because I think we as congregations and ministries in, in a similar geographic region here in Southwestern Washington are like the people that are walking along the road and, and trying to figure out, um, you know, who are we? What are we doing? How are we preaching the gospel? What are we being called to do? And trusting that Christ is walking with us as we walk together. So um, the synod is... Um, is a, like I said, we're in a geographic area. If you look at the map there, I, I very um, roughly outlined the parameters of the Southwestern Washington Synod. So we go from slightly into King County, we have congregations in Federal Way, um, Auburn, Enumclaw, those are all in King County, but just barely into King County. And then down to the Oregon border. And then we have all of the Olympic Peninsula. So the, those are the parameters of, of the, the Synod. Um, we have just a snapshot. There's about 88 congregations and worshiping communities. It depends on how you count it. Some of the worshiping communities aren't um, incorporated congregations, but about 88 communities like yours that we relate to um, 
And then I did just a little rough. I looked at the last parochial reports because I was curious. Um, about 75% of those are in cities and suburbs and about 25% are in small towns and rural areas. You know what made me curious about that was actually the text for today. When I was trying to picture the crowd that was, was surrounding Jesus and it was so, you know, careful, Luke was so careful to list from Judea, Jerusalem, Tyre, Sidon, and thinking, well, where are those places? And I thought, huh, I wonder what our, you know, what, the, what are the percentages of, of urban people, suburban people, and rural people? Um, but 50% of our congregations have fewer than 200 active members. So we have, we're in a lot of places, um, but we're mostly smaller congregations. Um, there are, I think we counted maybe 10, don't quote me on this, um, but 10 congregations that have more than one rostered leader at, at serving them, but not very many. You would be one of them. Um, so mostly solo pastors and then lots of lay leadership. Um, I also really like us to remember to have, we're very congregationally focused, but there are a lot of ways that the ELCA is in ministry, not necessarily just related to congregations. So right now we have 15 roster chaplains serving in healthcare systems. Um, throughout the Synod. We have 27 early learning centers, mostly connected to congregations, um, but, but also some of them their own entities. That doesn't mean that the Synod staff is running those, just like the Synod staff isn't running your congregation, but they are ELCA identified ministries. Um, so I can Google ELCA early learning center and little lambs will pop up. You know, So it's one way and I think a wonderful way and an overlooked way that we face out into the community is through our early learning centers. Probably if you were to add up, where do we make the most regular contact with people in our communities? Um, it would possibly be through those early learning centers. You know, when people come, other than maybe 12-step um, programs or something like that. So. And then we have one specifically for university. <laughs> we just have one. <laughs> um, and some of those like PLU is a really good example of something that you need to be partners to do. Like one congregation isn't going to do a university, right? So PLU is, a, a, is related to all six of the synods in region one of the ELCA. So, um, and then we've gotten better, I think, in past years, thinking about not only when we think about the synod, thinking not only about congregations, rostered leaders, official ministries, but to actually think about the land we're on. Um, how, how does our context shape our ministry? Um, so I loved that worship began today with the land acknowledgement. More and more of our churches are doing that. Like saying, what land do we actually stand on right now? What do we know about this land? Um, who are we connected to because we stand on this land? Uh, it's not just like kind of the politically correct thing to do. What it's about is acknowledging context in a way that a colonial kind of Christianity did not, right? So if you, if you come in as a, a colonizer, you don't really care what the context is because you've got your thing and everybody else is gonna conform to it, right? So this paying more attention to our, our context is a way to push back against a colonial type of, of Christianity. And um, that's also true of like, like saying, what are our, like one of the unique things about our synod, I think other than Alaska, we may have, this is what I keep hearing and I don't know who's gonna verify it at some point, the most registered tribes 
in in arson. I think we have 17. I've heard 17 to 21. I think it depends on if you're counting those who are federally recognized and those who are not. Um, that's a lot. And that makes for a really interesting uh, context and potential relationships. We also have an amazing number of rivers and watersheds in our synod. And so to think about how, how might that shape our ministry? We're water people out here, aren't we? You know, in the Puget Sound, how does that shape? How could that shape our ministries? Um, so when we think of synod, we think of all of those relationships, not just with incorporated congregations. Um, any any comments, thoughts, questions about that? Um, any conversation around that? Yeah. Do we have any indigenous congregations? Uh, ones that are just dedicated? No. We have um, we have an indigenous deacon. Um, she's just going to be ordained coming up here. Um, but in terms of um, indigenous congregations, no, no. There's a lot of conversation around that. Um, we have to be so careful with that because of, of uh, our history with, uh, again, colonial kinds of Christianity. Uh, we have indigenous members of congregations, but not congregations that are specifically planted by indigenous. Other comments, questions about that particular way of viewing synod? When people say the synod is coming, what are they usually meaning? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Paul Revere. <laughs> the synod is coming, the synod is coming. <laughs> yeah, they usually mean staff, don't they? They usually mean synod staff, yeah. <laughs> but going back to the indigenous people, in what, in what way, in what way um, uh, is the Senate working with the tribes and what work is being done at the Senate level to increase the uh, understanding and the, of, of, the, of the tribal people and the, the integration of those people into the congregation? What, in what specific ways is the Senate working to see how that happens? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's, do, let's jump down into that box that says justice work teams. And I'll say just a, a little bit about the Native American work team, which ha, has been, it's one of our, our um, longest existing of our justice teams. And they have been at work for probably at least seven years. I, it might date before that, that I'm not aware of. Uh, forming relationships first with any indigenous leaders that we have in, in the ELCA, um, and then building relationships through them with, um, with the vari various tribes, but very much at the invitation and to follow the lead of what's going on. So there's been some land, land acknowledgements, um, some uh, uh, events where we come together um, for something that, that indigenous folks are doing. So not you come to us and do our thing, but we'll go to you and, and join you by invitation in your, in your thing. The other thing the Native American work team is doing is, and this will be, I, I believe by the educational events this spring, this is one of those things that got kind of delayed by COVID, is, is designing uh, a plaque that congregations can put. Our hope is that um, all of our congregations in the Synod will have a plaque in their gathering space that names what land they're on. So in other words, a land acknowledgement that's, that's in every building. Um, so they've been doing that work. Um, there are congregations that have um, Native American um, worship services um, once, usually once a year where they invite some of our native leaders um, to come to speak, to lead worship. Um, so there are those relationships um, that are growing and the Native American work team stewards that. Um, 
I think it's either the work that came up in the faster set or the banners that we have out front. Yeah. They communicated that they that highlighted a, a that. Program. So that's where how we got connected with the banners. Right. Yeah, and they didn't they didn't invent that, but they highlighted it. They amplified it. Um, a couple of our leaders, uh, native native leaders that are doing really good work um, on that and kind of guiding all that are Pastor Linda Smith, who's a past retired pastor, um, past uh, deacon, almost deacon, deacon candidate Bonnie Sanchez, um, who, if any of you were at Senate Assembly a couple of years ago, she. She was a co-leader of a workshop on missing and murdered Indigenous women. And then um, Marva Janik, who is a member of Shepherd of the Hills and Stevenson. Those three women have been doing a lot of leadership and they're all, all um, Native women. Thank you for that question. Um, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll just drop down into that box then. Um, so the, the Synod, uh, is organized. Um, we have several organized what we call justice work teams right now. Um, and they're made up of a, a synod staff person supports them, but doesn't chair them. And um, but we are we're involved in all of them. So the anti-racism work team, is anybody here on that one? I was wondering if we had anybody on the stay on that. That's a newly developed developing work team that um, Bishop Jake is the, is the staff person that supports that. Care of Creation is one that is also new that is being stewarded right now by the folks at Holy Trinity in Port Angeles um, who are doing some great things with that and are going to be reaching out to other congregations to see how they want to partner. The Hunger Committee, that's probably that. That's the longest one. That's that precedes the Native American work team. And I know you, you folks have done all kinds of things with hunger and that, that team does a lot to make sure that the hunger grant money that's available um, every year from uh, churchwide and from the Synod is dispersed. Um, it, it was amazing when we had money coming in at the beginning of COVID for that, just to be able to see all of the hunger ministries throughout the Synod. Um, you know, hunger is something that Lutherans have done a lot of work in for a lot of years. And it's a it's a really like it's in our DNA as Lutherans. Um, land theology, affordable housing. So this used to be called just affordable housing, but um, Joey Ager, who is our new um, our new director of evangelical mission, we're also he also has a title bishops associate. So we're both using that title now. Um, Joey is comes from a community organizing background, he would be a fascinating person for you to invite to forum to. He was most recently a church uh, community organizer for the Church Council of Greater Seattle. And he was working on this very issue of not just affordable housing, but working with com faith communities who are discerning what to do with their land. So he starts really deeply in a theology of land stewardship and where do our ideas of our care for the land come from? What is our faith tradition when it comes to land? And then he is now launching, I think he's going to be able to do two cohorts of congregations, um, one in the Federal Way Tacoma area and one maybe Vancouver, I'm not sure where the second one is, but bringing together lay leaders who are um, discerning some issue around their land. And that might end up being affordable housing. But if, if you're selling a piece of property or if you're downsizing your building, um, how do you think about that? And how can that decision be guided by your values? So rather than just selling to the developer that offers you the most money, <laughs> how can it actually be ministry, your gift, your gift that you that you are um, potentially giving. So um, that's, a, that's one that Joey's working with. Native American work team I talked about. And then the RIC work team is the one that I relate to. And that is made up of, it's interesting. It had an interesting genesis. Um, uh, there were folks in the Synod doing work um, on reconciling with Christ. 
I'm assuming most of you know what that is, so I'm going to say is a reconciling the price of our nation. Um, so this work team right now um, is made up of about eight people. And what we're doing, we're, we're focusing on three things. One is um, being a conversation partner for congregations that are thinking about becoming reconciled with Christ, walking with them, talking with their leaders about what would that look like. We have probably a good, there's probably a good seven congregations right now that are, that we're just about to do that before COVID. And, and what we're hearing a lot is it just the timing doesn't feel quite right. Like when we come through this, then we'll, we'll go through that process, that building inclusive church process. Um, so we're walking with congregations, being a conversation partner. We have a strong feeling that for our synod, it wouldn't be a good fit just to proclaim ourselves in RIC synod. Um, that feels good. That feels good. But does that mean that when an LGBTQ person walks into one of our congregations, they'd be welcome? That doesn't mean that. Not unless they've done their work. And so we're focused on, even though it's slower <laughs> and it maybe doesn't feel as, um, hey, look at how awesome we are. We're an RIC Synod. Um, I think it would be the thing that would offer the most genuine welcome to LGBTQ people when they showed up in churches. So we do that. We also have convened a couple times the, the leaders of congregations who are um, RIC. We have 12 of them in the Synod right now. That's going to that's gonna take on a, a sharper focus this year. There are going to be more opportunities um, as we gather the names of, of lay folks in the congregation who were part of, of the RIC identity. And the question is simple. How are we living out this identity? You know, we've got the thing. How are we living into this identity? And now there is an anti-racism component of that too, that, that um, Reconciling Works is requiring in order for you to consider yourselves an RIC congregation. And then um, what we're also focused on this year is building a, a, an advisory committee. What we're thinking of is kind of a wisdom circle of people who are LGBTQ, um, who, who will be advising us, holding us accountable for our work, not having to champion their own welcome. We're not gathering all of our LGBTQ folks and saying, okay, figure out how to figure out how to get this done in the Senate, right? Um, it's those of us who are in the more privileged places who are saying, we need to do the work, we need to lead the work, but we certainly can't do it without having the wisdom and advice of people who are the most impacted by the church's damage to LGBTQ people. So those are the justice work teams that are going on right now. And, you know, if you're ever wondering, like, you know, how could I be a part of, of that? It's simple. You just volunteer. <laughs> you just volunteer. And then you get put on the email. You know, everything's going on right now via Zoom. And you're just put on the list. And then... Um, you know, there's, there's some really good relationships that are forming around that. It's a way to be involved with other people from the Synod, um, with other, uh, mo mostly congregation members. They're mostly all congregation members. You go on the website to find out who to contact regarding those? Um, yeah, if you go on the website, it will say, like RIC says, you contact me, um, contact Bishop Jake, or you just call the Synod office. Or you can ask your pastor. You can ask your pastor. <laughs> I thought maybe you were back there stealthily, so I wasn't, I wasn't calling your attention to be back there. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe I'll circle down. I'll go clockwise here on this handout. So um, in terms of staff, which I do, I, I, I listen so much for people talking about the synod because usually they mean the bishop and his staff. And the synod is so much more than that. And we're trying to get more careful about saying the bishop's office um, as opposed to the synod, that when we talk about the synod, we're talking about you <laughs> or this geographical area. But we, I notice that, that in our office all the time we're saying, well, ELCA needs those forms by blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but we are ELCA. That's us. So we need to say church-wide 
offices need those forms. So we're all trying to get more careful about our language. So yeah, so um, I think a lot of you know this, but the because you're close in, you're one of our close in congregations. Um, it, we're located in Parkland and right in the old parsonage of Trinity Luther Church. And uh, we are one of the smallest synods with 88 congregations. I think Alaska is smaller. There might be one other synod that's smaller. Um, and so we're one of the smallest synod staffs. Um, we are, uh, there are four of us um, who are full-time. We have a very, very part-time person who helps with um, kind of data entry and, and she's working on our, our database system. So Bishop Jake, Bishop Rick Jake is in his seventh year of being Bishop and serving his second term, entering his eighth year maybe. Um, so he will, two terms is what you serve in the Senate, if, you know, if you're reelected. So he will be wrapping up his time as Bishop in 2025 maybe. Does that sound right? 2025. And then um, I'm one of the associates and I'll, I will serve a six year term with him and then I'll be finished when he's finished. Um, Joey Ager is actually an ELCA employee. Um, the Synod does contribute partially to his salary, but he is mostly a church wide employee. Um, so he does not have a term. Uh, his, his term doesn't, he serves at the pleasure of the bishop, but he doesn't have a term like I have. Um, and then Allison Keys. Allison was Ramsey, got married, is now Keys, and is uh, the office manager and, and predates all of us. She has served with Rob Hofstede. And, and I tell you, Allison goes down for all the trouble. <laughs> so, so, oh yeah. She's got the history um, and knows where everything is. So, um, in addition to being a very talented. And she's actually the staff person that relates to the hunger committee. She does a lot of work with hunger. Um, and if you are working with that, you know that. So, so just stop and interrupt, raise your hand. Just, to, yeah. Um, what covers the rest of Washington? Is there just one more center? No, that's a good question. So if you, if you kind of follow on the, on the, if you look at that black line, the east line there of our synod, if you were to follow that up, King County, Snohomish County, Skagit County, Island County, Whatcom County, that makes up the Northwest Washington Synod. And they have, I think, 100, 100 congregations, maybe. Um, and then the, if, once you get to the Cascades and over, and then all of Idaho is one Synod. It's, it used to be called Eastern Washington, Idaho. It's now called Northwest Intermountain. Um, because they do have um, Jackson, Wyoming, and they have Ontario, Oregon, which seceded from the Oregon Synod. <laughs> I would love to know that story. <laughs> Having grown up in Eastern Oregon, I'm like, oh, there's a story there. Yeah. Yeah. So, Northwest Intermountain Synod. And then we were, one thing that's unique about Region One. Um, it, and region one is Alaska, Northwest Washington, Southwestern Washington, Northwest Intermountain, Oregon, and Montana. So those six synods make up region one of the ELCA. And region one is, is well known and has a long history of working collaboratively together. So once a month, all of the bishops and all of the people with my job meet. And uh, the bishops actually meet every, once a week. Very collaborative, very collaborative. If I, I work with the call process in the Senate. And so if I have a congregation where I know a pastor will be leaving and they, they need a certain kind of um, interim set of skills, you know, I'll lift that up to the whole region. And people will say, oh, you know, here's two or three people that, you know, there, there's not a sense of like, they're mine, you know, they belong to me. There's not, there's not, there's a, there's a joking competition about <laughs> like, do not call that person to person or whatever. Um, but there's a lot of collaboration. So I, th I think that really blesses everybody um, because of that. And my understanding is that's not necessarily the case all over. I'm sure every region has their gifts, but that's one of the gifts. Um, Rip, Bishop Jake is currently the only male bishop in Region 1. 
So, <laughs> how many congregations in, in the whole in the whole region or the whole country? Other region. Yeah, that's a good question. I should know that. I think there's 30 in Alaska, and a hundred. I'm going to say 100 in Northwest. I think there's about 105 in Oregon. I. I'm not way off. I might be off. It, it's a little intimidating that this is being reported <laughs> because I may be way off. Okay. Um, so two, 200 are 80, 300, 300. Um, I'm less sure about Northwest and I'm going to say 500 somewhere. 500. Northwest has got to be how many congregations because it's such a large. Region or in Northwest Inner Mountain? Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. No. no, there are very many Lutheran houses. Uh, Idaho has very few Lutherans. Really? There's a very few. Oh. I was the vice president for the campus. Oh, <laughs> 90 there. I was rounding to other. Rounding to other. Yeah. So geographically, it's large, but yeah. population. Yeah. Makes it so <laughs> yeah. Lots of time on the road in both person and staff, in both. Um, Northwest Center Mountain and Montana. That's huge. I don't, do you know how many of their congregations are in Montana? I think it's around 120. 120. To, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lots of tiny ones. Lots of really tiny congregations. Yeah. So, um, I I was asked what my particular job areas are. We all have our own kind of portfolio, for lack of a, such a corporate word, our own um, areas. So my main areas that I work with, the, the one that takes probably 50% of my time is, um, is mobile, is call processes, is congregations in pastoral transition. So, um, since I've been in the two and a half years I've been here, I've worked with about 25 processes. Um, so that's not always lead pastor and that's not always, I came in at the end of some of those. So from uh, what that looks like is from the time that a pastor calls and says, it looks like I'm gonna be leaving, clear till you install the new person. And so that can be, um, uh, January 30th, I just went to Mountain View Church in Edgewood, and they had a call vote for their new pastor. And so that was, that will be two years in April. So some of them are longer like that, particularly during COVID. Um, and some of them move much more quickly than that. Um, so that, that takes a lot of, of my time and, and focus. So yeah. So of those 25, were they all field state or were some of them No. I, I do work in partnership with, um, with the folks who have my job in the Presbyterian Church and the Episcopal Church. Um, one of the things that we're working on doing right now is if you look at that little map again, um, I've been talking to my Presbyterian and United Methodist colleagues, and we're trying to map where our congregations are. Um, I haven't done that yet with the Episcopal um, she has an awesome title. Her title is Canon to the Ordinary. So much fancier than Bishop's Associate. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to try to do the same with her. But so there's a version of, of what I do in each of those. And partnerships, what it's all about now, you know, with full communion partners. So we have two partnerships right now with the PCUSA, with that, that brand of, of a Presbyterian church. Um, one is the one we were just talking about down on the coast, Grayland and, and uh, South Beach. And then Saren Lutheran and um, First Presbyterian in Hope are actually a federated congregation. They've actually joined leadership. They're not even just a yoked congregation. So. Um, right now, there are more ELCA congregations than there are um, PCUSA and United Methodist and Episcopal uh, in our particular area. So we have ELCA clergy that are serving um, 
in all of those that have relationships with all of those denominations. Yes. So I would say, uh, you think you would say what was left after the other PCUSA is is the open and affirming branch of the Presbyterian Church. Yeah, and you know our siblings in the United Methodist Church are going through this right now too. So we have a relationship in in one community where we've been wanting to 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 build a relationship. My my uh, my Methodist colleague, United Methodist Church colleague, and I have been talking about trying to build a relationship, but that congregation has not um, decided which way they're going to go in the Methodist split. So but, but, let me say something that is good about that. And that is that that is because the Methodist Church is a, is a worldwide community right. unlike exactly. the ELCA which is America. And because it is a worldwide communion, that means that those congregations in Africa, for example, who have a history, long history of homophobia, are uh, not going to vote for the coordination yeah. of, of gay yeah. and gay clergy. So that's the problem. We're just the United States. Yeah. 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 There are several United Methodist congregations who also don't want to, you know, to, to go that direction, but um, they are, you're right, their polity is very different from the ELCAs. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Lots of them. Yeah. United Methodist churches. Yep. Lots of them. And United Methodist Church, or, or I don't know what they were called then, I don't know what their official name was, but the Methodist Church in America was way out in front on women's ordination, way before any Lutheran bodies did that. So there's definitely a progressive, a progressivism in Methodism. Um, so call process is one of mine. The other area that I work with um, a lot is candidacy. Um, so candidacy is what we call the process um, that both Seth and Sister Ann, Pastor Seth and Sister Ann can talk about. It is the process um, through which you become a roster leader in the LCA. So you become a pastor or a deacon. So candidacy is that we have kind of a two track uh, preparation time. One track is seminary and one track, oh, and Deacon Cherry as well. <laughs> You're just not standing up. I can't see you right in there. <laughs> um, the, um, and the other track is candidacy. Um, it's a formation process that the synods oversee. So even though I do have partners that I work with at the church-wide level, the candidacy process is a synodical process and um, or is overseen in the synod. And so right now we have 21 people who are in some place on the process um, from our synod preparing for to become deacons or pastors in the ELCA. Um, that's a very labor intensive process. And walking with people is a very labor intensive process and a delightful process. It's delightful. Um, by the time you are ready to be a roster leader in the ELCA, you have been um, asked every question that there is. You have gone through multi <coughs> psychological profiles. And um, it's all about having leaders in public leaders in the church um, be trustworthy. You know, theologically trustworthy, and by that I don't mean you all need to be able to recite the meaning to Luther's, you know, uh, explanation to the creed, although it doesn't hurt. But um, <laughs> but theologically trustworthy that you're not going out there preaching things that are doing harm to people. You know, so theologically trustworthy, relationally trustworthy. So uh, the the church invests a lot in making sure that leaders are prepared to be leaders. Um, and so call process, candidacy, and then I also am the staff person that works with SALM, which is the program for strengthening actively ministry. And this as well as a, just a delight, I love this part. I have a teaching background and um, I'm not, I, I teach one, one term of this program, but I'm not the teacher of the program. 
but I love the putting the curriculum together, thinking about um, what would be helpful for students to learn, and I love working with the students. So we have cohorts of 10. We're in our fourth cohort, even though our third quarter cohort was during the pandemic and only had one person in it, so she's joined cohort four. <laughs> so cohort three is a big gap that reminds us of our pandemic year. Um, this is a program for people, for lay people, who are not discerning a call to professional ministry, but really are discerning, they have a longing for more, more depth of knowledge about the tradition, more, um, maybe they're preparing to step up in leadership a little bit more in their congregation. Um, out of this program could come some folks with the gifts for being an actual synodically authorized minister. So for instance, right now in Forks, um, Forks doesn't, uh, Prince of Peace and Forks doesn't have the resources right now for even a part-time pastor. So they're being served by a synodically authorized minister who's a graduate of, of Psalm. Um, that doesn't mean everybody who goes through Psalm will be a synodically authorized minister. Um, but that could be one thing that comes out of there. So it, um, the, it's a program that's got um, eight courses that are taught over two years. Um, Pacific Northwest Context, Intro to Old and New Testament, Church History, particularly Lutheran and the Reformation, uh, Pastoral Care, Lutheran Worship, Evangelism, The Craft of Preaching, and Lutheran Theology. So, uh, so we have, there are nine in the cohort this year. Um, they come from north, south, um, all over the Synod, and and uh, people who have graduated from the program are serving in all kinds of different ways. The, the thought is that they're preparing themselves for, for service in their congregation mostly, but then we will tap them for other things as well. There are some that are gonna be leading an educational event. Um, uh, our current synod treasurer came through the Psalm program. So it's a way to get to know people's gifts to the gifts of our lay folks. Any questions about that? Or do you want to sign up? <laughs> Did I pitch it, Melinda? Yeah. If you want to sign up? If you have any questions, please talk to me about, about it because um, it is, as I said, just four years old. We've had other manifestations of this, of lay ministry programs. Maybe some of you have been, been through those, uh, but this is the current manifestation. So those are the main air work areas and RSC work team. And then just, you know, other duties as a sign, like all, like all positions, um, you know, I try to serve as a, you know, a confidant and supporter of Bishop Jake in, in any way that I can um, as well. So then the last box there that I haven't talked about, but I think I've talked about most things in it, except for new mission starts, which I'll talk about in our last few minutes here. Um, the, we think of our work this isn't official, but we think of the main focus of our work as a staff around growing leaders, cultivating new ministries, and energizing existing ministries. So when we meet with the Synod Council, um, we, we, we talk a lot about these three things. So I've said a lot about growing leaders because that's what my, uh, my job is focused a lot on. Um, the third bullet under growing leaders is providing training and resources for congregational leaders. So if you were to go on the Synod website, you would see a variety of resources that are put there for congregational leaders. Some of it is, you know, how to do personnel reviews, how to do church budget, how to, you know, how to fill out a W-2 for your employee. You know, it, it has a lot of super practical stuff. Um, and there are also some, we provide some webinar trainings on just kind of how to, how to be, uh, uh, you know, in like a 501c3 in the state of Washington, you know, how to, how to um, be an organization, I guess is the word I'm struggling for. Cultivating new ministries, this is, um, has been a long focus in the Synod. Um, we have currently eight mission starts. They're called mission starts, even though some of them are older. But what this means is that they're funding uh, doesn't largely come from themselves. Um, and 
their leaders have particular training for doing uh, raising up new new communities. So um, the missions the mission starts that we have. Let me try to name them off the top of my head and jump in and help me if you want. Um, so living stones in the Shelton prison um, and a light of grace, uh, Korean ministry in Federal Way are probably our two boldest mission starts. Federal Way Chinese Fellowship um, worships, uh, they are in right now Calvary Lutheran Church in Federal Way. Um, Rock City in Tacoma, the, the community that uh, Pastor Andy Jones Barnes leads. Um, Empowering Life here, um, that I think some of you are involved with at the prison, uh, at the women's prison here, Andy Carver. Um, should be able to do these off the top of my head. These are these are the churches that Joel works with. <laughs> um, empowering life. Uh, they'll come to me. Should have written them now. Anyway, there are eight right now. Oh, Jubilee Collective in Vancouver. Uh, missing two. I apologize for those two. It'll come to me though. So um, the they receive uh, funding from. Uh, our synod, and they receive funding from uh, churchwide, and that's that's a, so they're being born mostly in um, communities that have been underrepresented in the ELCA. So, uh, oh, Joyful Ministry, that reminded me of Joyful Ministry, which is um, uh, Pastor Jay Young Ma, and that meets is a Korean ministry at Mount Cross. That's a brand new one, and our other brand new one, I got it. Um, Love God Ministry, uh, pa Pastor Vera McEwen, and right now that's a completely online ministry. Um, it wasn't necessarily going to be that, but it started like the month before COVID and has built quite an online following. So, and all of those, just about all of those are in uh, communities of folks that have been typically not members of the Western churches. So Asian, um, African-American, uh, Jubilee Collective have a, a specific outreach to um, LGBTQ and people living on the street in Vancouver. So. Well, both churches are, it's a, it's a plan that they will most likely always remain yeah, that's a really good question. The question is, will they always remain mission churches and not have their own resources? That is really a to be determined thing. So in the case of the ones in the prisons, yes, they'll always be because there's no way of them becoming self-funding. Perhaps the other ones as well. Um, and that that's that's a good, lively conversation about all kinds of things to do with um, how we take an active role in building relationships and taking down barriers where there have been barriers. You know, it's expensive to be a church the way we imagine church, isn't it? Because there's buildings and there's furniture and there's professional clergy and there's it's an expensive proposition. And as long as this is the way we want to do church, <laughs> we may always have barriers for communities who aren't communities of resource. So well, that, that would be a great conversation to have with if you invite Joey Ager out to talk to you, that would be a great conversation. He's the one that is in those conversations with the ELC church-wide staff more than I am. Um, Cultivating new partnerships that we were just talking about, you know, meeting with our ecumenical partners, um, meeting with partners that have common values that might not be churches even. How can we be in mission together with other places that value, um, you know, hunger, other places that value safe space for kids? You know, how can we form partnerships that aren't necessarily going to be congregations? How can we be doing ministry that doesn't end up just looking like a congregation? 
Um, and then energizing existing ministries. Um, I actually, my focus in the call process is um, energizing congregations. That's my focus. I mean, people think that it's about finding a new pastor. It's actually all about like, who are you? What is, what is God calling you to right now? Mission clarity. It's a, it's a fantastic time to work with congregations on discerning what the spirit of God is calling them to do. And then out of that, how, you know, what kind of staff do you need for that? But to, to kind of shake us loose from this transactional view of a call process, like, oh, we just lost our pastor. We need a new one. Can you get us a new one? And, and really have that be a time of, of focus and clarity, revitalizing, um, revitalizing mission. Um, we're doing a lot of re revitalizing ministries through forming cohorts of, of congregations. So if you're a congregation that really feels called to this, let's partner you with some other congregations that are doing that too. And Zoom has made that so much, people's facility with Zoom has made that so much easier. Like, let, let's all talk if we're doing land discernment. If we're really into hunger, let's all talk. If we have, if we feel called to start a preschool, let's get in a cohort with other congregations that are, that have been doing this ministry. So lots of formations of cohorts has been a good way of revitalizing and re-energizing ministries. Okay, um, both, both, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so then on the back, and please just, again, please interrupt me if you've got questions. On the back, I did that pie chart of, uh, I just looked at the Synod's budget and I plugged in the figures and I thought they would end up on the pie chart, but they didn't. Um, but if you look at that, it's about, um, so 40% of the money that comes to the Synod goes on to uh, ELC churchwide. That's how they receive their, their funding. 42% of the money that comes into the Synod goes to staff salary and benefits. 6% um, goes to our regional partnerships. And the lion's share of that is all the finances of all six Synods in Region 1 are handled by one Region 1 finance office. And the same woman has been doing it ever since I've been a pastor, I think, Alice Baker. And... Um, and we really cut down on overhead by having one person do all six sentence. So that's that we contribute to that. Office administration and space is about 8% of our budget. Outreach is 3%, but I'm going to say more about that. And then agency and social is 2%. So the money that we give to uh, Lutheran Community Services Northwest. Now, this is just, this is not the pass-through money that comes from congregations. This is just the money that comes out of the synod budget. There's much more money than that that goes to those agencies, but they come from you through the synod um, to the very various Lutheran causes in the Northwest. Um, if you look in the box then under that pie chart, we're really very fortunate to have some good endowment funds. And thank you to any of you who have donated to the endowment fund or to the most recent campaign that was done about three years ago, four years ago. Um, we have three major endowment funds. And I wanted to give you an example of how that money is put to use. Um, I work with the Mission Endowment Committee and last week, right before I prepared this, <laughs> we uh, looked at uh, Maynard Hedegaard is the person who does all the numbers. We looked at what we are going to be able to distribute now in 2022 from our 2021 endowment money. So this year in 2022, from one of the funds, um, we will be giving just about 40,000, we can take just about $40,000 in interest from that fund. And then there's a HOPE fund that is the proceeds from Hope Lutheran Church in South Tacoma. When they closed and sold their property, they gave all of their money to be used for new and renewing missions. So that fund this year yielded $31,000 to be used. Those monies go directly to our outreach board and they fund new and renewing missions. 
Um, along with, if you were to look at just the line items in the budget for this year, there's another 30,000. So it's right around $100,000 this year that's available to be used by new, new mission starts and new, ministry, new ministries. And then the Morrison Fund, which is a fund named after Steve Morrison, former uh, bishop's assistant for many years um, in, when this synod was new. Um, when Family of God Lutheran Church in Bremerton closed, he had been the mission developer of that congregation and his wife is still, is still connected to that, they set aside the sale of that. Um, we set up an endowment fund for seminary scholarships and debt reduction for new pastors and deacons. So this year we have four, just about $40,000 from that fund that will go to, there's a one-time scholarship that's offered to our candidates about midway through their training programs, their education programs. And then it will, for 10 years after you've been ordained, you can apply for a debt reduction grant if you have education debt. And so um, you apply for that and then we divide the money up and both the scholarship money and the debt reduction money goes to the lenders. I mean, it goes to either the, the institution, the educational institution or the lender. And so it's made a big difference, I think, for people who came out of seminary with, with debt that was really, you know, that was a lot. So that's what happens with that. There, I said all the things. There. <laughs> when you're working with uh, congregations that they uh, invest in on campus, do you use uh, trained intentional uh, ministers to so for inter for the interim, um, we use experienced interim ministers, largely retired. Um, many have had interim training, but not all. But experienced interim pastors. Now, there are exceptions to that uh, for certain reasons but mo mostly yes. And I tend to work mostly with retired interim, with retired pastors. I know you were. As you are working with the congregation to ascertain their ministry, it's very important that these people have training to help the congregation yeah. after do the process, not be just ending everyday ministry stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And they, what, what they do do now is work with a transition team. And I don't know if that was a model. Um, I wasn't aware of this model of, of call process until I got into this job. So there's, before there's a call team, before there's a call committee, there's a transition team that is set aside to do a congregational self-study and then writing the ministry site profile. So the transition team is made up of members of the congregation that are leading that. And then the interim pastor provides support to that team. So the, the current model of, of pastoral transition involves lay people leading a congregational self-study that results in a ministry site profile. And the interim pastor is trained in how to support that team to do that. Could be a gathering then, or the interim pastor. We used to have. That. Do I have what? Gatherings of the regular training gathering. On Zoom. Interim yeah, on Zoom. It was a lunch. It used to be a lunch in the Senate office once a quarter, but I think I went to one of those before it all became online. So Zoom gatherings, yes, but not, you know, not a luncheon or anything like that. No. Yeah. So uh, how many congregations are in the call process right now? And, uh, uh, and I guess many? the other question, are you having difficulty finding candidates for the smaller congregations? Yeah, how many congregations are in the call process? And this will wrap up with this question. Um, right now, in various stages of the call process, we've got about 12, um, various stages. And are we having trouble finding candidates for the smaller congregations? 
Uh, theoretically, yes, but so far we've been able to. I mean, we're having trouble finding people for any carnation. Um, when I first started two and a half years ago, I started in September of 2019. The pool, when I would sort for um, people willing to come to region one, I would get about 150 people. And that's about, yeah, um, this week when I checked, that's about 84. So it's been cut almost in half during the pandemic. So it is challenging, but you know, I tell you, it's, it's like, it, it kind of makes you just believe in the Holy Spirit because, you know, I'll start out thinking, oh my gosh, well, I don't know how that's going to work. And then something happens and someone comes along and, you know, uh, and it, yeah, it's just, God is faithful. That's all I can say because it's not, you know, it's not any super skill that any of us have. It's, it's really so far so good, I guess is what I would say to that one. <laughs> I am having trouble finding trained interim so Daryl. Are you ready? <laughs> you ready to throw your hat back in the ring? <laughs> yeah. I think we're at our time now. Um, if you wanna chat more, um, if any of you are going to the later service, I'm happy to hang around after. I also, oh, I should have put my um, my uh, name on that. The, the Synod website, why don't they put any of that on it? It's just, SWWA Southwest Washington, SWWA Synod.org. So there's lots of information on the website. Uh, I'm really, I'm sorry, I didn't need to put that on this piece of paper. Um, and then I'm easily accessible through the Synod office as well. So, and um, Pastor Seth has all my information as well. So thank you. I appreciate you, you coming today. Thank you.